are these people? You been seeing anything about the Kursk offensive? Um, Not until you pulled this up, you lost. Well, people forget because there's so much of our news is constantly distraction. Um, but uh, this is happening over in Ukraine. So they they they're they're gonna beat the Russians, Colin. They're they got this one offensive, and it's gonna be a hail mary, and they're gonna get a touchdown. Woo! Except that might not be the case. I I I I'm betting your brain is already on this. So blue check Beth is replying to this this person down here, which you, we know what we say about having this flag in 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 your thing when the tweet comes out. You know, Caitlin Johnstone right. certainly knows you're about to hear some stupid. Um, but they say, Umphies, how's the Kursk situation going? Just tell me if it's good or bad. Right? Like, oomphies. So, first of all, cringe button pressed. Um, I don't know who needs to hear this, but oomphies is cringe AF. <laughs> oh, and it's going horribly for Ukraine. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, um, so we're going to hear from Greg Stoker. Stoker. Okay. And over in yes. Mint Press, right, who gives us this lovely video that we're going to see here in just a second. But he also tied this article to it um, titled Kursk Offensive, Ukraine's High Stakes Gamble for Diplomatic Leverage. Right. So you're wondering what that deal might be. So we'll get to that. But this is an actual hour live stream that he did that I do recommend going to go watch. Right, you can find it on State of Play over at Mint Press. Um, it's on the Mint Press channel. Uh, I would leave it in the description, but YouTube's not letting us do that right now, so that's fun. But it is it is in the article if you go find this on Mint Press. Um, but um, you know, he he replies to this CNN video that we're all gonna watch with him. Um, and where they're talking about this Kursk offensive, and he's going to push back on some of that propaganda that we are about to witness ourselves. So if you're wondering, this is Kursk, it's in Russia, this is Ukraine. Yeah, we'll get to maps in a minute, but here, let's watch this. Um, here we go. First of all, this is going to be the first reporting that I found. Uh, this is going to be from CNN, August 8th. And we're going to look at this and compare it to what we're seeing on the ground. What we've been seeing perhaps for two days now is one of the most significant incursions into Russia since the start of the war and total silence from Ukraine on the record about whether their troops are genuinely behind it. In the past, we've seen uh, Russian citizens volunteering to fight for Ukraine, making those short incursions into Russian territory. But this, if you believe the Russian narrative, is potentially the Ukrainian regular military striding uh, five kilometers, three miles deep into Russian territory, possibly further. The target of much of the assault appears to be a town called Suja. Uh, Russia calling this a major provocation. That's the words of President Vladimir Putin, suggesting that the Ukrainians have been firing on residential areas. A bit rich after Moscow has been doing that in Ukraine for over two years. Uh -huh. But he was. Yeah, Except of course they, they qualify been. that. Uh, you know, civilian targets have been struck, though, obviously. Um, yeah. He was assured by his chief of staff that the advance had been halted. A very different picture, though, seen on social media videos. Some suggesting, uh, without what we can confirm ourselves, that even Russian servicemen were surrendering uh, to Ukrainians, according to some Ukrainian accounts, showing damage inside the town of Sujda and potentially a multi-pronged Ukrainian move uh, inside of Russia. Why? Well, some analysts are pointing towards a gas terminal near Sujda, which controls Russian gas that moves through Ukraine to Europe. Still, That's definitely part of it. There's also a nuclear, yeah. uh, in terms of important key civilian infrastructure there's also a nuclear power plant in play but this is very superficial 
supposition by CNN. Of course, it's only like two days into it, but we're going to really flesh this out. Well, now in the third year of the war, that may now be under Ukrainian control. That may have been the objective. Kiev often uh, looking to get control or inflict damage or influence on Russian infrastructure. But it's also a rare moment of good headlines for Ukraine in a war where they've seen the Donbass front line uh, find Russian forces moving forwards incrementally, deliberately. And, you know, now they're, they're being honest. This is kind of one of the main strategic goals of this operation. I mean, there's not a lot of tactical gains. And we'll talk about like different ways to conceptualize military operations on this because there's like three levels of conceptualization. There's uh, tactical, like boots on the ground, operational, the entire battle space, and then strategic, which is like the geopolitical objectives of military action. So strategically, one of their goals is a PR win because guess what? They kind of need a big PR win right now. So CNN's not wrong when they say like, this is finally a good headline. It is objectively to suit their goals. But very steadily towards Ukrainian military harms. It's been simply bad news for Kiev for quite some time. Okay, so uh, that's the initial reporting. Uh, it doesn't really give anything to the audience. Any questions? Um, no. Yep. Yeah. Uh, well, <clears throat> let's skip forward a bit um, to his article that he writes with this. Um, so let me uncopyright protect that. Um, so six days ago, the Ukrainian army initiated a surprise counteroffensive into the Russian region of Kursk along Ukraine's northern border in what is the largest regional gain since the Kharkiv offensive nearly two years ago. The AFU initially captured over 350 square kilometers of territory. So this is the armed forces of Ukraine's first offensive on Russian soil and has apparently caught the Russian military unawares. However, the salient question remains, what are the goals of the brazen offensive? After six days of observation, it is becoming clear that the battle for Kursk could either end in a significant strategic victory that improves Kiev's negotiating position in the stalled peace talks or a grave blunder that diverts men and material away from the fighting against the steady Russian territorial gains to the south, the Donbass is, after all, more valuable than Kursk. Which, do you, do you hear the steady, right, being used? He's, he mentioned it earlier, right? Where right. it's, to me, when you listen to that CNN thing where they're talking about, well, they've, they've hit civilian targets, I do believe that's not the case. That yeah. they have limited civilian infrastructure, especially when compared to israel's civilian infrastructure targeting which we seem to be perfectly fine with um like the amount of damage to civilian infrastructure has been minimal because of this slow steady push which has made it harder for russia to do right like they could drop a hundred bombs on any of those cities they are modern capable army you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. so, you know, they've been very strategic in their response. So, like, that I think has been proven. Um, but let's look at. So, you're probably wondering why Ukraine even decides to, right? Yes. So, the likely goals of the incursion are to stall the Russian initiative and territorial gains made since the start of 2024 and to secure a much needed public relations victory for Ukraine in light of recent Russian successes. This would help shift the narrative to a more positive one for Ukraine, which is crucial for both its demoralized population and Western politicians who are increasingly hesitant to fund a losing proxy war. Additionally, Ukraine on, aims to capture and hold as much territory as is military viable to strengthen its diplomatic leverage in the event of resumed peace talks or a negotiated settlement, right? So another strategic objective is to improve Ukraine's leverage within the EU by capturing the Sudza gas metering station, right? We've seen this be pretty important to Europe, right? You know, um especially when you, when you look at the Nord Stream being a factor, right? Um, which pumps nearly 50% of all Russian gas e exports to the EU following the destruction of the Nord Stream. Okay? You know, and we definitely know who bombed the Nord Stream. Let's keep that in mind. Yeah. 
Ukraine may potentially threaten to shut off the gas flow to silence critics of the war, such as Hungary, which has vetoed several aid packages in Brussels that tend to provide military support to Ukraine. So this is part of the leverage they want, right? They're strong-arming Europe, essentially. Um, you know, that's a nice gas pipeline. Be a shame if anything fucking happened to it, huh? <laughs> it's that, <laughs> right? So... It is clear that Ukraine, already experiencing a military-wide manpower shortage, has committed a significant resources and assets to the assault, including two of its most well-equipped and fastest fighting brigades, the 22nd Mechanized Brigade and the 80th Air Assault Brigade, which at first looked like a typical lightning raid meant to embarrass Russian military leaders, now appears to be a more extensive operation. The AFU will try to hold this ground in order to shift Russian force disposition away from the Donetsk region and go for a larger, much needed PR victory. Right? So they're moving away from the Donetsk into this like area Russia's had control of. Right? So mm -hmm. Russian President Vladimir Putin and Foreign Ministry Sergei Lavrov had reiterated several times during the failed Swiss peace summit in June that Russia's open to a ceasefire deal, but Kyiv would have to take into account the realities on the ground, implying that Ukraine would have to cede territory controlled by the Russian military by holding territory in Kursk. Kyiv hopes to flip the script, seeing that President Zelensky said last week on X, our unwavering goal is to prepare a real foundation for a just end to this war already this year, and it is possible. So that's Zelensky saying that. Right? So, right. if this is indeed the primary goal of Zelensky, if it's of Russia, it looks more like a massive long-term blunder, since there's little chance the AFU can hold Russian ground into the autumn months with manpower and supply line shortages, and a loss of territorial gains will undermine any short-term PR victories. So, any questions so far? Nope. Thoughts? Concerns? Um, well... Here's the thing. I thought Ukraine was working towards a peace deal. Well, they've uh, there's been some shenanigans with that where they were going to, but a particular, you know, troll-looking individual by the name of Boris Johnson decided to go over there and put a stop to that. Um, so, uh, but, you know, we've covered that. We've covered that Ukrainian peace deal. So, uh, you know, essentially that this is, they're trying to get political leverage for p another peace deal, right? We're trying to move away from Ukraine, you know, and especially if they can get Kamala to broker it, they'll be more than happy to take that, I think, you know, or they get Trump to do it, one of the two, you know, mm -hmm. so kind of like Iran hostage negotiation stuff. It's like, oh, suddenly when you're inaugurated, things get fixed. You know what I mean? So, but anyway, um, let's go back to Greg Stoker. And he had another video to showcase, this time from, from a Reuters cutout. Um, if we look at other media and how they're reporting it, and, and I'm focusing the beginning of this episode on this, because... It's really important uh, to understand like how most people's view of this conflict is manufactured and maintained. We're going to look at some of the information Forbes was focusing on through a subsidiary channel. And it basically is just sticking to like what elite units were involved in the operation and no details beyond that. Again, I think it's important. We're going to look at it. A column of armored vehicles rolling into southern Russia's Kursk Oblast on the third day of Ukraine's surprise attack into Russia confirms the involvement of one of Ukraine's best equipped and fastest moving brigades, the 80th Air Assault Brigade. The Forbes media outlet reported this. It is noted that a video that circulated on social media depicts a T-64BV or T-80BV tank a UR mine clearing vehicles, an IMR2 engineering vehicle plus BTR-80 and US-made striker wheeled armored personnel carriers rolling past a busy Ukrainian mortar crew. Okay, so this is really not information that you need. What is interesting is they do have strikers, which are US 
armored personnel carriers. I used to um, have to do a couple of operations and strikers when I was in Ranger Regiment. They're pretty low maintenance. Uh, they don't need a lot of gas. They're they're fast. Um, they're a good fighting vehicle. And yeah, they, they were using. It's clear that they were using their best equipment and best troops for this operation. And we don't know how many of those they actually have left. So they kind of may be uh, expending like surplus uh, equipment that they don't have. All the vehicles are up armored with anti-drone cages. Infantry crowd at the top of the BTR-80. Forbes recalled that only the 80th Air Assault Brigade operates that mix of ex-Soviet and ex-American vehicles. Further confirmation is found in a separate video shot by a Russian drone depicting strikes on ex-German Marder tracked fighting vehicles in Kursk Oblast. The 80th Air Assault Brigade, like its sister unit, the 82nd Air Assault Brigade, apparently operates Marders alongside its strikers. The Marders are heavy. The strikers are fast. They suit the Ukrainian Air Assault Force's preference for swift but powerful attacks. And of course, this is why one of the units, this, this unit was chosen. Um, this is not the most tactically uh, important region. I mean, you do have the massive gas pipeline, which could be consequential, but I don't think they're going to turn it off uh, and, and start using it to leverage diplomatic power with Europe. We're going to get into that. But yeah, I mean, this was kind of undefended because it wasn't the most important place. It was from a different front and they got in there fast and quick before Russia could organize, at least at first. Now there's there's a pushback and there's some resistance happening now a few days later. It did take some time to mobilize, but this is why they chose uh, to do a lightning raid in there because uh, can they hold ground with light infantry units? I'm, I'm not really seeing any tank units. We're not really seeing a lot of artillery go in there. So this is why people originally thought that this was a raid and not like a hold, an incursion where they're going to try to hold ground. But it looks like now they are. According to Forbes, the participation of the 80th Air Assault Brigade, one of the better Ukrainian brigades, underscores the scale of the Ukrainian operation just north of Ukraine's northern border with Russia. Forbes says that in the 29 months since Russia widened its war on Ukraine, pro-Ukrainian fighters have launched many raids across the border into southern Russia. But okay, so the footage we're seeing right now is apparently, reportedly, Russian soldiers being taken prisoner. I can't tell if it's a op or if it's real. I'm sure some prisoners were taken. It was a lightning raid. They were caught unawares, at least initially. So prisoners are going to happen. Anytime this happens, that's going to happen as well. So I can't vouch for the authenticity of these uh, prisoner photos, but uh, yeah, that, I just wanted to point that out there. These raids have been small in scale and limited in scope and have never lasted more than a few days. More than anything, they've been meant to embarrass Russian leaders. The general staff of the armed forces of Ukraine believes that this offensive may force Moscow to transfer troops from the Donetsk region and slow down Russian successes in this direction. In order for this tactic to bring success to Kiev, the Russians must transfer many troops from the Donetsk direction. If the Russians stop the Ukrainian offensive in Kursk without bringing in additional forces, the offensive in Kursk will lose its meaning. All right, well, that's a pretty unsophisticated summation of the situation. Uh, combat forces will be redeployed to deal with this. Uh, Russia cannot tolerate an attack on its sovereignty and uh, ground being taken. Uh, the, and we'll get into that in a second. But so that's where we're at. Um, understand now? Vaguely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Um, cool. Well, um, let's look at um, Big Sergi um, on Twitter at right Sergi says. Working up a full write-up, but it seems that Ukraine's foray into Kursk has created yet another crinky. It's an operational, isolated attrition pit. Will turn out to be a profligate waste of resources if Kiev thinks that they can use it as a bargaining chip. Well, they're already pretty well stalled out. Use the forest canopy to gain strategic surprise. Parlayed that into two or three days of driving around wildly while RU scrambled units in. Now they have to double down on a path to nowhere. Lots of subunits involved, making the Orbat a mess, but total personnel in Kursk not more than a few thousand. Now their staging areas and approach lanes will be pummeled. What a mess. Right? So, Rubenstein and Klarenberg at Taunis at Law. Um, the BBC reports it's likely some sort of Western permission was granted for the Ukrainian occupation in Russia's Kursk region. Publicly, the Ukrainian government did not offer comment, but the language here strongly implies BBC was told of its approval on background. So here's the BBC, given consent, Western worries of the war escalating. It's likely some sort of permission was granted for an operation of the size on Russian soil. 
In general, very few senior Ukrainian figures are saying much about this attack. The president's office told us no comments yet. Right? So Kit replying to Big Sergey, success of Kiev's Kursk incursion amply underlines why Russia could never allow Ukraine to join NATO. A 2,000... 300 kilometer long flatland border with zero natural defenses can be concretely can't be concretely protected 24 7 precisely the risk of this happening that made it such a red line for the kremlin so that's where we're at um so he also here's uh, what he was referencing. So he was heavily invested in this. I led the U.S. delegation to the closing ceremony at the Winter Olympics, right? Pageantry with Putin and Russians. This was like a while ago. Um, so he responded in the only way I think that he knows how and the only way he thought was support of Russia's interests were, you talk about Russian sphere of influence, Ukraine was the reddest of red lines from Putin's point of view, Right? So, um, but we have Dave DeCamp weighing in as well. Um, we have just all the Indie Media Award honorees in this list. Um, <laughs> so, Zelensky acknowledges Ukraine's offensive in Russia's cursed oblast. Again, Dave DeCamp over at antiwar.com. Go follow him if you haven't already. Um, he writes on Saturday, Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky acknowledged for the first time. Remember, we heard Kit Clarenberg talk about they haven't. Right? Well, on August 6th, Ukraine's US backed ground incursion into Russia's cursed Oblast. Zelensky, oh, Zelensky said in his nightly address that the Ukrainian military is working to push the war out into the aggressor's territory. He added that Ukraine was proving that it really knows how to restore justice and guarantees exactly the kind of pressure that is needed pressure on the aggressor. Right? Already all sorts of phrasing and rhetoric here. Um, fighting has been raging and cursed since Ukraine launched its invasion and the Russian defense ministry said on Sunday that its forces prevented a breakthrough deep into Russian territory. The Russian defense ministry claimed that since August 6, Ukrainian forces have lost 1,350 soldiers in Kursk, but the number isn't confirmed and neither side has released information. The ministry also claimed that its forces deployed 29 tanks, 23 armored personnel carriers, 9 infantry fighting vehicles, 116 armored combat vehicles, 20 cars, 3 self-propelled launchers of the Buk M1 anti-aircraft missile system, 3 launchers and an AN-MPQ-65 radar station of the Patriot anti-aircraft missile system, a launcher of the Grad multiple launch rocket system, and 10 field artillery guns. What does that sound like to you, Colin? You know, just all this armament. Like, we have anti-aircraft, we've got tanks, infantry fighting vehicles, you know. Like <laughs> uh, yes, anti-aircraft <laughs> missile system, lock, 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 rocket systems, right? So they're trying to hold this. Local officials said 15 civilians were wounded when debris from a Ukrainian missile hit by Russian air defenses fell on a residential building. Isn't that nice? Um, where does that sound? It sounds like Israel, too. Um, due to the fall of missile debris on an apartment building in the regional center, 15 people were injured, all of whom are receiving necessary medical care. Right? So, acting cursed Governor Alexei Smirnov wrote on Telegram, um, the U.S. is supporting Ukraine's attack on Kursk and has said Ukrainian forces are allowed to use U.S.-provided weapons. So that's U.S. weapons on what, Colin? Sorry, say it again. U.S. weapons being used where? On what? Where where is Ukraine using them right now? In in Kurds. Which is was Russia. Russian territory. Right. Right? So remember how that was a red line for Putin like a couple of weeks, like months ago? 
where it's like, mm-hmm. if this happens, expect some European cities to get hit. Right? Because if right. they're complicit in this, that's why would we not do that if you're going to do it to us? Right? So, anyway, um, fun all, everywhere. So, in the ground incursion into Russia for the first two years of the war, the U.S. prohibited Ukraine from striking Russian territory with U.S. missiles, but recently lifted that restriction in the wake of Russia's offensive in Kharkiv. Right? Mm -hmm. So, Russia's defense ministry has reported that its forces have destroyed U.S.-made Bradley fighting vehicles, U.S.-made striker armored vehicles, the sanctioned use of U.S.-provided weapons in a Ukrainian ground incursion into Russia marks a significant escalation of the proxy war. The Pentagon has said the U.S. still does not want Ukraine to launch long-range strikes with U.S.-provided weapons, but has not defined how far into Russian territory would be too far. Zelensky is asking the U.S. to lift all restrictions on Ukraine's use of U.S. weapons. This is what we will continue to talk about with our partners, just as air defense protects lives. Lifting restrictions on long-range strikes will save thousands of human lives. Will it? Being able to strike more people will save lives? Bomb more, save lives. That is what Zelensky is saying here. Um, But guess what, Colin? NATO doesn't think it'll work. No. Okay? So, Dave DeCamp, again, Biden called Ukraine's ground invasion in Kursk a real dilemma for Putin, but NATO countries think Ukraine won't be able to hold territory in Russia's Kursk. So, which is it? Huh? Again, (laughs) NATO countries think it's unlikely Ukraine will be able to hold territory in Kursk, even if it takes weeks for Russian forces to drive the Ukrainians out. Bloomberg reported Tuesday, citing a Western intelligence official. Okay. Despite that assessment, the report said NATO doesn't harbor reservations about Ukraine's invasion of Russian territory, which the U.S. and NATO claimed they were unaware of the attack until the attack started. Another NATO official told Bloomberg that the incursion shows Ukraine can challenge Russia. Heavy fighting has been raging in Kursk since over a thousand Ukrainian soldiers and dozens of armored vehicles, including many provided by the U.S., entered Russian territory last Tuesday. Right? Um, And Ukrainians are taking heavy losses. So here's the map, right? Um, So they lost over 2,000 since the invasion started as of August 13th, I do believe. But I want you to look here, Colin. Right? right? Look at this graph. And blue is Ukraine, clearly. Red is Russia. Right? Do you see this red line here? Mm-hmm. This is what they had. Okay? Like, that's where the border was. And that's this incursion. Right? Mm-hmm. Of Ukrainian forces. Okay. So, have you ever watched Shaka Zulu? Yes. What is he known for? What is the major military technique Shaka Zulu is known for? Oh, I forgot. Uh, I forgot the name of it. But what does it look like? Has a very what? strategic look. Yeah, like kind of like a... Classically horns, right? Horn, yeah. Right? A lot of cow stuff in Zulu culture, right? <laughs> including their shields represent rank anyway i'm a weird nerd um (laughs) but um invented a spear better than anyone else best spear very good spears um what does that look like to you as far as this red line here this this red here (laughs) like I mean, it's kind of hard to see on my screen, but it looks like... Right, it's, it's horns. All right. Yeah. Right, yes. This is... the peop- This is going to get caught. They will surround this very easily. Right? Right. Like, this was their border. I'm sure they put defenses here to allow them to better defend this. Right? So, all these people in here are going to get fucked up. Right. (laughs) 
Like, this is a suicide mission if I've ever seen one. You know? So, like, if they were able to push out this way, right? I'd feel like, okay. Right? Like, if they try to surround here, sure. But I, I, I think this is a very specific region they tried to get in with. This is their floodgate, and we can close this floodgate pretty easily. So we'll see. Uh, don't look good for my end. Um, anyway, the invasion is seen as a tent by Ukraine to gain leverage in future negotiations. We talked about this, right? The sooner Russia agrees to restore a just peace, the sooner the raids by the Ukrainian defenses forces into Russia will stop, right? This is also resource gathering as well, right? Ukraine's been kind of running dry. That's why they were talking about raids. Um, cause there's been lots of that, you know, um, while the U S claims it was unaware of Ukraine's plan to invade Kursk, it is also strongly backing the invasion by allowing U.S. forces to use U S weapons. Again, we talked about this real dilemma Biden talked about, remember he's actually still president allegedly. Um, so the U.S.-backed operation, which is the largest invasion of Russia since World War II, marks a significant escalation of the proxy war and risks a major Russian response. Putin has said he views the incursion as the West using Ukrainians to attack Russia. Any questions? I don't think so. Sounds about right. <laughs> um, closing thoughts before we head out of this one? I thought you again. I thought Ukraine was fighting for peace, mm. or at least more open to it now. Yeah, but but that's what I don't understand. It's like they're losing badly, and the idea that now they're well, I guess who knows? But I think given. It's anyone's game, really. It could be Trump or Harris. Like at this point, it could be even one of those two. Um, but it almost seems like when it looked like initially that Trump was, you know, Trump was doing well, mm. it seemed like, oh, okay, well, we need to, we need to wrap this up. Because so there's no way that the Republicans would necessarily continue giving money to Ukraine, although they would give money to Israel. But I, have you ever yeah. watched Tasting History with Max Miller? Mm -hmm. Um, it's a food show on YouTube, right? And speaking of Biden and presidency, um, this is about Sh Shaja Alder, right? and Al-Mali, which if I heavily suggest people go watch this um, to get what I'm talking about. Um, I'll link it in chat for people. That'll work. Um, but um, it talks about how that, that lady that you saw on the thumbnail was her sultan husband died right right and like she was writing all the uh like policies and stuff and signing the the requests to generals and whatnot right mm -hmm. this is like greater syria egypt you know stuff um but very interesting history that people should go look into um but i just found it very fitting with what we've been hearing about Biden, you know, um, that the lady Sultan behind the scenes might be writing the, writing the checks, so to speak. Um, but anyway, well, any questions for a head out of here? I don't think so. Cool. Well, talking about these things, especially Ukraine is why we're demonetized. You can go to codashfee.com slash Indie News Network, scan that QR code on your screen with your camera apps on your phone. And, you know, if you're in the live chat, you can put exclamation mark donate. 
Um, you can always find all the ways to support us at indienews.network. If you go to that URL, um, you know, links to links to donate and stuff will will always be included there. Um, but if you can't do that, very easy. All the engagement you already hear from every other YouTuber, like and subscribe, share the video. We are heavily suppressed. Any little bit helps there. And leave a comment. Let us know what you think. You know, what's your opinion on it? But anyway, thanks for watching.